Sometimes we get a little bit sleepy, so if you need to close your eyes for a few minutes, that's okay. I'm not gonna not gonna get offended. I know it's hard to stay awake for these these mid-afternoon lectures. So, but um, so uh, we we're uh, looking at the prayer before communion, and uh, we finished the part just now on what your mystery is and who your enemies are that we're talking about in that prayer. So. The next part we come to is one of the more interesting parts of this prayer. And it's interesting for a number of reasons, but we say, Nor will I give you a kiss as did Judas. Which is kind of strange. Interestingly, in this entire prayer, the only person mentioned by name is Judas. In our society, we like to focus on positive, happy stuff, right? Like they say, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, but this prayer doesn't mention any good people. No shining examples of who we should be like, no holiness, no saints, no good apostles. Instead, it focuses, only one name is given, and that's on the betrayer, because it's such a strong part of who we shouldn't be when we receive communion. So we know that Judas notified the religious leaders that he would identify Jesus with a kiss. And uh, why a kiss? Why didn't he just kind of point or nod, you know, that, that guy over there, with the beard, the white robes, you know. He could have done that, but then he would have been noticed. He wanted to conceal his betrayal. So the concealment of his betrayal was important, and it was done under the guise of a kiss. He figured no one would find out. He did it for his own protection. Isn't it even more scandalous considering how intimate the kiss is, too? The, the what? The... But, 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 but is it, it, is it, isn't the, isn't, say, like, the betrayal here even more scandalous because, because, because of, of how intimate a kiss is, too? It's a very, it, sure, it's, I mean, it's the ultimate hypocrisy, right? You know, to <clears throat> show love when, in fact, you're showing hate and betrayal. The Jewish culture is customary to read a rabbi with a kiss. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't have been an unusual action in that sense. Right, and so that conceals it even more, you see. So the fact that it's so mundane, such a mundane act, is the best way to indicate that so Judas stays out of trouble. But what this prayer is getting at is this, by, but like Judas, we too can betray the love of Jesus Christ in our lives by receiving communion unworthily because really that's the core of what this prayer is all about is preventing us from receiving unworthily that's what saint john chrysostom called <clears throat> receiving eucharist when we're not properly disposed saint john chrysostom called it the kiss of judas to receive communion unworthily when in fact we are pretending to be something we're not our preparation for receiving the holy gifts needs to include a personal determination to embody divine love more completely in our lives. So we promise not to follow Judas in <coughs> professing love for Christ when in fact we pre are pretending to betray him. We're, it's talking about pretending to be the friend of the Lord and then betray, just like Judas did to Christ's enemies. He revealed his secret with the kiss. Plotting treachery, he stretched out his hand for the Lord to wash, and his hand to his foot for the Lord to wash, and his hand to receive his body in the Eucharist. With lips stained by the sacrilege of that unworthy reception, he kissed his Lord and God in betrayal. And driven by his love for money, 
unable to seek forgiveness, he hanged himself in despair. And the story of Judas urges us to examine <laughs> ourselves and how we receive the body and blood of Christ. And yet how often have we been Judas by receiving the Eucharist indifferently, holding a grudge against somebody, holding anger in our hearts, not thinking about what we are doing, or in a state of terrible sin. How often have we treated our reception of the body and blood of Christ as a mindless ritual where we approach for communion, thinking perhaps of anything other than communion? How often have we received in a state of grave sin? Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Of course not, you think to yourself. I've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm a member of the visible church. I sit at the communion table. All these are so many kisses on my lips. But am I sincere in doing this? Do I lead a sinful life and live, yet receive communion with my soul, stained by sin? St. John Chrysostom taught us that if we do, the way to receive communion is no different than the way that, uh, the way that Judas kissed Jesus. So St. John Chrysostom teaches us that the kiss of Judas is the unworthy reception of communion. Do I live carelessly? and yet I make a profession of being a follower. Then I expose my religion to ridicule. I lead men to speak evil of the holy name by which I am called. We need to be sincere and true and avoid every false way. And God forbid we should become high-soaring professionals and successful people of the world, and even in the church, people with comfortable lives who take all kinds of expensive vacations, but then fall into the lake of fire after we've passed on to the next world because we betrayed our master with that kiss by receiving communion unworthily. When we read this part of the prayer, we need to ask ourselves, am I Jews? Of course not, we think. Well, am I living in such a way that it brings shame on the Lord? Am I in love with the world, entertainment, possessions, passions, fleshly things, that it dominates my days? Faith that is devoid of repentance is not <coughs> genuine Christianity. And yet so many people receive communion who believe they can be Christians but living any way they want. And we see this sad situation with the younger generation, living like pagans, freely living together, fornicating, going to church when they feel like it or not, not confessing. They don't think twice about approaching for communion. And they feel no penitence, feel no repentance. The reason for this is they are unconscious of their sins. So I have to admit, we as a church, though, are at fault. Because so many priests, and we talked about this a little bit earlier uh, today, are afraid to talk about sin. They don't want to give, you know, shall we say, negative sermons. They don't want to talk the fire and brimstone because they're worried people are going to quit or complain. So they only say nice things during the sermons. My congregation, and one of my members is now here, Nick has joined us, will tell you that I'm not afraid to challenge them to grow in the faith, even if what I say makes them feel uncomfortable. Because a pearl will not grow in an oyster unless you put a grain of sand in there to irritate it. And my congregation knows I can be very irritating. So, <laughs> so to give a kiss, as did Judas, is to go to communion in a state of sin and to receive the body and blood of Christ without approaching <coughs> the sacrament of confession. Говоримо про фразу і поцілунку тобі не дам як Юда. Ми згадуємо ту Юду і тільки згадуємо Юду, бо Юда зрадив Ісуса. І ми не повинні бути як Юда. Ми і є стоямо як Юда, як ми недостойно приступаємо до святого причастя. Ми мусимо себе зробити і спецовісти і подумати, чи ми є в стані тяжкого ріха, чи там якої. Ми не можемо прийняти те часто, як в серці сидить злість, або заздрість, або якийсь там якийсь гнів. Так що те часто треба приймати достойно, бездоганно. Інакше ми поводимо свята і людей, ми зраджуємо Ісуса, як ми приймаємо те часто, як в стані ріха. So the last line of the middle part points to where the prayer before communion is going to end. We pray like the thief and confess to Jesus. With this part of the prayer before communion, our hearts and minds move spiritually from Holy Thursday and into Good Friday at this point in the prayer. It's very much an experience of the crucifixion <coughs> on Mount uh, Calvary. Because we're all called to be crucified with Christ on the cross and to carry our cross. 
This whole prayer is really the prayer of the thief on the cross. Let's look at the first part. Here we have some repetition, but there are some subtle variations between these repetitions. It says, remember me, O Lord, when you come into your kingdom. This part of the prayer is a quote from Luke chapter 23, verse 42. We read, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. And when we receive communion worthily, we enter into that paradise. But why does God, or why does the prayer ask God to remember us? What does it mean to be remembered? To be remembered means to be saved. To an atheist, their memory will only last as long as people remember them, maybe one or two generations. If you go to see gravestones that were erected during the times of communism, you'll always see photographs of people put onto the graves, because that was their idea of being remembered. But St. John Chrysostom said this, if you knew how quickly people would forget you after your death, you would not seek in your life to please anyone but God. A lot of people understand the Vichnaya Pamyat at the end of the Panacheda, the everlasting memory that we sing at the end of funerals as saying that they're going to have an eternal memory of the deceased in their hearts. And, and on one level that is, that is true. But what it really refers to is the salvific memory of Jesus. Because to be remembered by Jesus is to be saved. That's what we learn from the thief on the cross. He teaches us something. But for those who partake of the body and blood of Christ, your memory will be eternal. Because Jesus' memory of you is going to be your salvation. In the story of Lazarus and the rich man, you notice how the rich man has no name. <coughs> Only Lazarus is named. The reason for that is because the rich man was forgotten. And to be forgotten is to lose your salvation. But while I, like Judas, make my own physical encounter with Christ like his physical kiss on Christ's cheek into a thing of betrayal and condemnation, if so, that it will be I, not he who touches Christ at the chalice, attempting to transform that encounter to my own manipulations and ends. Or will I be like the thief, who in a single moment of encounter received the kingdom, receive this Eucharistic encounter as a reality that will transform my very existence. If so, then perhaps like the thief, I too will hear the words that all of us want to hear. Today you will be with me in paradise. So that's what it means to be remembered by Jesus. To be remembered is to be saved. The memory of Jesus is salvific, and that's why we sing Beach Nayapamian at the end of funerals. Not so much because it's going to be an everlasting human memory, but because we pray that Jesus will remember our deceased and grant them salvation. And then the prayer shifts slightly. It says, remember me, O Master, when you come into your kingdom. <coughs> Why does it do this? Because Master is the title given to Jesus after his resurrection. You don't see that used before his resurrection because Jesus is the only master. He is all wisdom. He is the only truth. And there's a resurrectional quality to this messianic title. And no one can be this. Only he has given the example of a most holy 
perfect life like his heavenly Father. He who sees me sees the Father, sees God. He reflected the whole image of God. He alone is the teacher of holiness and the only master. And who among teachers can give grace? Only Jesus. No one except him. So thus in this part of the prayer, we shift slightly. We call Jesus master to acknowledge that he is our divine teacher leading us to salvation. And that our will must completely yield to his just like a slave would to a master. І тепер друга фраза – це поміни мене владико. Чому ми кажемо владико, бо Ісус має це звання після свого воскресення. Тільки після воскресення. До воскресення Йому ніхто не звав, ніхто не називав владикою. І бо Ісус каже, хто мене бачить, хто бачить Бога. Then we shift the prayer again slightly, to now we say, Remember me, O Holy One. What is that? So in the third variation of the prayer of the penitent thief, we now pray to God as the Holy One. The book of Isaiah helps us to understand our relationship to God's holiness in the Eucharist. We read the words, <coughs> these are the only three words repeated in the Bible three times in a row. We hear, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. When Isaiah grasped the reality of God's holiness, he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. These words we read in chapter 6, verse 5 of Isaiah. I, Isaiah's understanding of God's holiness brought an overwhelming sense of his own uncleanness his own guilt, his own shame. Have you ever felt like Isaiah? So sinful, so immoral, so ruined, so rife with bad decisions, bad choices, that it seemed almost pointless to carry on anymore. Well, watch what happens to Isaiah when he has this experience. Isaiah doesn't run and hide from God's holiness. Instead, it exposed his sin that was not very pleasant, but he did not turn away. And neither did he try to excuse himself by blaming his parents or his spouse or his poor circumstances in life or his bad luck. He admitted it and accepted responsibility. <coughs> and the only way that he could ever be holy was to see himself as God saw him, acknowledge his sin, and admit that he deserved divine judgment. If that were the end of the story, we'd be destined to live our lives under a continuous cloud of condemnation and of guilt. But then look what happens. We read, Then one seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. As we read in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7. God took the initiative and cleansed Isaiah's sins. Those of you who are listening after I distributed communion today, I said those words. I always say that after communion. And this passage is very much a metaphor for what happens when we take communion. Once we acknowledge our guilt and our uncleanness before God's holiness, we can be like Isaiah who had his lips cleansed by that hot coal. The hot coal on his lips is like the communion that we take that cleanses us of our sins. Think of that hot coal of Isaiah next time you take communion and you feel it going to your mouth to understand the cleansing effects that the Eucharist has on our souls and on our hearts. He washes away every stain. Then he actually allows Jesus to become our holiness, as we read in chapter, uh, the first book of Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 30, accepting us because of our relationship with him. By confronting God's holiness in this prayer and taking it in the Eucharist, it doesn't destroy our self-worth if we respond properly like Isaiah, but instead rebuilds us spiritually. So this part of the prayer is an experience of God's holiness and our sinfulness, from which we will be cleansed through the Eucharistic celebration. Remember, the Eucharist burns up our sins if we worthily receive it, just like Isaiah did. So this is a reference, remember me, O Holy One, to Isaiah. І остання ця фраза поміни мене святий. Чому святий? Це е, з книги Ісаї, пророк Ісаї, що він е, там 
jedyny mister show Biblii i pisze no, świat, świat, świat. Ospoń całego świat, świat, świat. Isaja e, perad Bogom baci sebe taj Bog je obačil hrišnjem. Min vizneje svoje vihje, min ne e, opravdujeca i e, primaje osuđenja vid Boga. A dumo šo bude velika kara, a zamisto do njoho priletil se na te i vzal bovilja, hojača bovilja i pretulil jemu do usta i tem vin očeščeni bov. I da nas pričastja je to bovilje, što očeštaje naše vihje, jer mi primajmo ce pričastja, tako što znači, čemu mi majmo biti dostojni, mi majmo priznati, što mi bačite sebe, taj Bog nas bači. I vesnate svoje vihje i pokajate se i ne opravdovate se, što tam čez toho, če to mu tako i tako. I ce res... Ну, прийняти, що це причастя, то має бути так, як ці богіни, що серед тим притрудив до густа і сам. And then we go on to the part that says, May the partaking of your holy mysteries, O Lord, be unto me not for judgment or condemnation, but for the healing of soul and body. So in the Eucharist, we are healed in body and soul. The Divine Physician has given Himself to the faithful, that same gentle healing. Christ, who walked the byways of Palestine nearly 2,000 years ago, is present to you physically and spiritually in the moment of the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the Divine Remedy, the Divine Medicine that can heal all ills in body and soul. The goal of every Christian is to be healed. That really is our journey as Christians. We are all in need of healing. And we must move from disease to healing, dis-ease to healing and health. And the Lord addresses an invitation to us, urging us to receive Him in the sacrament of the Eucharist. Truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. And to respond to this invitation, we must prepare ourselves for so great and so holy a moment. When we're expecting an important guest, we prepare for that guest. And St. Paul urges us to examine our conscience. He writes, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. And let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and <coughs> drinks judgment upon himself. Those who take communion unworthily, the Patristic Fathers teach us, will receive the Eucharist in a punishing way, both spiritually and physically. In the liturgy of St. Basil, which we say during Sundays of Lent and other times of the year, we read in the prayer of the litany before communion these words. Especially, God, let none of us become guilty regarding these awesome and heavenly mysteries of yours, nor let us become weakened in spirit or body by partaking of them unworthily. And many of the fathers of the church saw communion as a spiritual medicine, as an antidote to our sins, the poison we've introduced into ourselves. We've allowed a snake to bite us, and we need to get that antidote to get that poison out of our system. So to take communion worthily strengthens our body and soul. To take a communion unworthily is to ruin our physical health and destroy our soul. If you take medicine, you know if you go get a prescription from the pharmacy that your doctor gave you, you are careful to take it so that the medicine does not injure you. You wouldn't just take the whole bottle and drink the whole thing, right? Because you're probably going to get injured. You follow the prescription. You take the right dosages at the right times. You avoid any food, it says, to avoid. And that's where fasting is connected. In my own life, I've learned the consequences of not following prescriptions. I, I'm famous for not reading the bottle. But uh, I went to, after I had my cataract surgery, I was given eye drops. Well, I just indiscriminately kept putting them into my eye. Well, my eye got irritated, and I didn't know what was going on because I, far be it from me to actually read the instructions. So I did. 
I didn't read the instructions, so I irritated my eye. I went away after a couple of days, but, but I was irritating my eye because I was just putting eye drops in uh, whenever I felt like it, but in fact I needed to limit the amount of eye drops that I was using. So I didn't read the prescription, and I paid for it uh, with a little bit of a physical punishment. And with communion, so often people fail to follow the prescription, which is to approach in a state of repentance and grace. Okay, so, it, it, so you may get a, a, a prescription that says, take on an empty stomach, or take with food or whatever. You know, so if you, you're supposed to take it on an empty stomach, well, you take it on an empty stomach for it to be effective. And similarly, too, if we receive communion, we need to approach in a state of grace for it to be effective. Otherwise, it's going to harm us physically, like when I irritated my eye. Наступна частина – це нехай не на суд і не на осудження буде мені причастя, святий Твої тайм, Господи, а на стілення душі і тіла. Ісус є наш божественний лікар, а причастя – це є божественне лікування. Ми, як приймаємо причастя, то переходимо від душевних болів до життя вічного. І до прийняття причастя треба достойно приготуватися. Ми як готуємося прийняти гостей, ми до причастя ми готуємося, так, щоб гарно було і все, в хаті чистенько і, і так далі. А до Ісуса, як йдемо до, до причастя, то треба душу очистити і до, до сповіди, і визнати свої гріхи. Хто недостойно приймає причастя, може і фізично потерпіти. Фізично потерпіти і душе, як недостойно приступати до причастя. Треба сповідатися, щоб тяжкі ліки не були. Це, наприклад, лік, ліки приймаємо, лікар приписав медицину, а ви не прочитали, скільки там як брати медицину і є, можуть бути ну, так, небажані. Перепрошую, то є такі молитви до і після причастя, і такі гарні є слова, до речі, причастя, і, якби основні слова, які хоча б варто сказати, наприклад, коли ми приймаємо причастя, щоб це причастя мені дали не на опалення душі і тіла, а на життя вічне. Так, це священник говорить, як він дає причастя. Коли я даю. Then we get into the climax of the prayer. We say, God be merciful to me a sinner. In Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, we hear the story of the publican and the Pharisee. And this part of the prayer before communion incorporates the words of the publican, because we've now moved away from praying like the thief to now praying like the publican. And we are all called to repentance like the publican. That's why we ask the Lord to have mercy 59 times during the Divine Liturgy. This is the most powerful prayer Christians know that we have before God. It never fails because when you ask God for mercy, mercy always comes. That is a guarantee. It never fails. God always has mercy in us. Maybe we don't understand His mercy. Maybe we fail to recognize His mercy. Maybe we think His punishment is not merciful. But in fact, it never fails. God will always have mercy on us. This is the most powerful prayer. And the monks here in the monastery know that the Jesus prayer is the most powerful prayer. And they recite it continuously in order to receive God's mercy and drive demons away. And that's what makes the prayer so powerful. This prayer expresses our profound humility as sinners, but also as a hopeful trust in God's mercy. We realize our own utter sinfulness and misery in this prayer, but at the same time are vividly aware that God's justice is tempered with mercy and pity and tenderness and love. І доступаємо до останньої частини, як ми знаємо, називається «Не тарапомолитво Божого, ми 
Це є завершення нашої молитви. І просимо помилування в Бога. Під час світу і, Господи, помилуй, ми молимося, промовляємо принаймні 59 разів. І це найсильніша молитва, яка які слова є в молитві до Господа. Просимо Бога його милість. Ми в Бога маємо до ту довіру за Його милість. Що як прийде час судний, щоб він проявив свою милість на нашу гріш, на наші грішні душі. We would say, God, cleanse me of my sins. The idea of our need to be washed from sins and stains is a very important theme in the Bible. It is the foundation of our practice of baptism. Jesus said, unless you are clean, you cannot be my disciple. But the Bible's focus, of course, is not on the cleanliness of our exterior, of the skin, but in cleanliness of the inner heart. Not on the cleanliness of the flesh, but the cleanliness of the inner spirit. Not on the cleanliness of the body, but that of the inner soul. Not of the outer shell, but of the inner person. Jesus was enormously concerned about cleanliness, but his focus was on the inside of the cup and not the outside. John the Baptist, echoing the theme, said, Prepare for the coming of Christ to the earth. Prepare for the coming of Christ into your heart in the Eucharist by being cleansed of your sin, which is deep and deeply rooted within you in order to prepare for God to enter. In order to receive the purity of Christ within us, within our hearts, we know that we ourselves need to be purified as we prepare to receive Christ in our bodies, in our lives, in our souls. The Bible is very concerned with inner cleanliness, and cleanliness is important when we receive the Eucharist, and we make ourselves clean by confessing our sins and by repenting. І наступна фраза, Боже, очисти гріхи мої і помилуй мене. І знову помилуй. Ми як приступаємо до причасти, то має бути чистота внутрішня і духовна, і чистота в серці, з усім внутрі. Ісус хотів, щоб Він не так на зовнішньому чистоту дивився, але всередину, внутрі людини. Щоб душа була чиста без гріха, і ми приймаємо Ісуса в наші серця, то ми мусимо бути очищені. Значить, без, без гріха посповідані, і щоб його достойно прийняти. Ми прийдемо до останньої лінії прийняти. Це каже, Лорд, прийдемо мені, бо я не сину без гріха. The prayer before communion concludes with an acknowledgement that I have sinned infinitely. Remember what we said in the book of James, if you have committed one sin, you've committed them all. You're just as guilty if you have one than if you have them all. The prayer before communion acknowledges this. It's a humble admission that I am, for all intents and purposes, almost beyond hope and repair as a sinner. By saying I've sinned without number, I'm <coughs> casting myself onto God's mercy. <clears throat> the biggest sports event in the United States is the Super Bowl, which many of you watch. It's a time of intense football and sports history making. And in the National Football League, some of you may have heard of a referee, name was, his name was Ed Hockley. You ever heard of him? Okay. Yeah, Mick is, he's all into sports. So. But Mick was, or, or sorry, Ed, Ed was a lawyer by profession, but he was also a veteran NFL referee, so that's why I relate to him. But um, in 2008, um, Ed Hockley, I don't know if you're familiar with this game, maybe some of you saw it, he made a terrible call. <coughs> and there was a game between the San Diego Chargers and the Denver Broncos at uh, the Super Bowl. Just to make a long story short, there was a minute left in the game. And uh, the Denver quarterback fumbled the ball, and a linebacker for San Diego recovered the ball. But Hockey Lee incorrectly whistled down that play and ruled an incomplete pass <coughs> rather than a turnover. For those of you less familiar with the football, uh, uh, sport of football, just to make a long story short, his incorrect call cost the San Diego Chargers a game that they should have won. Half the nation was angry with him. But here's what he did. 
Instead of defensively justifying his mistake, he fully admitted it and he apologized. In fact, after the game, Ed Hockley went over to the coach of San Diego and he apologized and he said he blew it. And Hockley later on said, affecting the outcome of a game is a devastating feeling. Officials strive for perfection and I failed miserably. That's what Hockley said. But what's important in this story is the reaction of one of the sports writers who later wrote this. His name was Matthew Darnell, who writes for, writes for Yahoo Sports. And, and here's, here's the thing you need to remember. He said, it's hard to hate a guy who knows he screwed up and feels bad about it. <laughs> and that's what this whole prayer is all about. If you want to remember one thing about this prayer, just remember this. It's hard to hate a guy who screws up and feels bad about it. And that's exactly what this prayer is accomplishing. And that's, if we can feel bad for a guy who screws up and, and uh, we can forgive him, then surely God, who is infinitely more merciful than us, can <coughs> do for us what the other people did for Ed Hockley. And that pretty much captures God's forgiveness, as simple as that. It's hard to hate a person who sins and feels bad about it. Really, that captures the whole essence of this prayer. And God is ready to heal those who sincerely wish to amend their lives but can't take, cannot take pity on the obstinate sinner. And notice that there's no excuse made for sins here. When it comes to sin, we like to create a justification that's pleasing to ourselves. As we read in Psalm chapter 140, or Psalm 140, verse 4, uh, we like to make excuses for our sins. If we wish to be saved, we must always accept responsibility and not attribute our wrong acts to God. And God, who is most compassionate, will forgive us. Our human tendency, and this is human nature, is to conceal and minimize our sins. I don't think any of you walked around telling everybody your sins today. Right? That's just, just, not, it's just not what we do. We feel, though, that God's compassion means He's going to go easy on us because we're human, but we still need to be conscious of our sins. Repentance doesn't mean feeling bad about ourselves, guilty and miserable, but rather it's about seeing the truth of ourselves. And that truth is painful sometimes. But it's a truth that God already knows and that we need to embrace in order to accomplish true repentance. <clears throat> We're so tied up with fear and pride that it's hard to admit how much we sin, how deep the roots go. When we admit this truth though about ourselves, this is the truth that sets us free. The most perfect man is the one who precisely as he is a man sincerely feels he's a great sinner. St. Seraphim of Sarah said this, as we read in the book of John, if we say we have no sin, we lie. Instead, we do the opposite in the prayer before communion. We admit to an infinite amount of sins, as St. Cyril of Jerusalem says. And therefore, in that do we find our worthiness to receive the body and blood of Christ. So I hope that this has been helpful for you to understand some of the nuances that are in this prayer. Often we read through these liturgical prayers and either we don't ask questions or it doesn't register with us because we've read it a thousand times before and we just get used to those words. So I hope that this has kind of broken it open for you a little bit, kind of like breaking open a citrus fruit and, and uh, experiencing its aroma and its, its strong, strong flavor. І знову підкреслюю, це все повторюється, що ми мусимо визнати свої гріхи перед Богом. Ми мусимо себе бачити та як, е, і усвідомити, як Бог нас бачить. Е, чи ми один гріх, е, один переступ виконали, чи, 10, чи один чи десять разів переступ, то грішні. Так що е, ми надіємося на Божу милість. І щиро треба покаятися і гідно приступити до причастя. І так себе бачити і усвідомити, які ми є перед Богом. So I hope that tomorrow morning during liturgy when you recite this prayer, you'll remember at least something uh, from the last uh, last two hours of lecture and something will say, hey. I can connect with that or I know what that means and, and this, the prayer hopefully will be more of a me <coughs> more of an experience for you as you prepare for communion to receive it. So, so I'd left a, a few minutes for questions. Is there anyone that would like to ask anything about 
not just today, but the stuff we talked about yesterday or anything at all. This is this is all the fulfillment as I said of Canon 713. So uh, we praise together prayer, fasting, Eucharist, and works. All four of these things come together in this canon, and this is how we can live all of these things out from the spiritual. Thank you. Yes, sir. I do have a question in terms of uh, reception of the Eucharist. When we say it's not good to receive unworthily, mm -hmm. that it be the fire of God's love, that burning coal, mm -hmm. but yet how to reconcile that, and I recognize that uh, Eastern Christianity is full of paradoxes, Yes. Uh, but how to reconcile that with Christ as the divine physician, that is our healing food. Exactly. So it's it's an antinomy, as we'd say. It's it's we have we have two opposites welded together, which form a truth, and that's exactly what it is. On the one hand, the Eucharist is there for the healing of our sins. On the other hand, if we don't receive it well, things only get worse for us. So so the way to under the best way to understand it is yes, it is is for the the kind of it's kind of concludes penance. So penance is when we get our sins forgiven and then. Eucharist, shall we say, burns up any trace or any shadow left of our sins in all of us. So that, that's one way you can think of it. So, but it is an antinomy, you're right. On the one hand, it's for the forgiveness of our sins, and, and we say that, you know, throughout the liturgy. On the other hand, um, you shouldn't take in a state of mortal sin. So, on the one hand, it forgives. On the other hand, you shouldn't take in a state of sin. So it's really about preparation to receive worthily, and that'll be effective. It's just like medicine. If, I, if you follow the prescription, the medicine's effective, and if you don't follow the prescription, the medicine can actually harm you. So, so that's one way you can understand it. But yes, it, there, are, there are tensions and antinomies in, in our Eastern uh, theology on the subject. So you, you've hit exactly on, on that. And there's about 18 different ways uh, to be forgiven your sins. If you, uh, if you want to read the quiet prayers tomorrow before the uh, gospel, like the, the little, you know, the fine pr prayers that the priest prays, um, you'll see that um, they, they talk about different ways in there of being forgiven sins. But uh, the ordinary, from a canonical point of view, the ordinary way to have sins forgiven is through the sacrament of penance. But there are other ways to have sins forgiven as well. So, um, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, um, so my question is about holding grudges and uh, receiving Holy Communion. Um, I guess I mean, had that prayer before the. Uh, so how does that work okay. in, in general? So if you're struggling with a grudge, you mean? You know, yeah. So uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, probably the best way to understand things like grudges or 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 uh, forgiveness is this. You know, the the mind says what should be, but the heart says what is. Okay. So in other words, our minds say that yes, we should forgive. But our heart doesn't always follow that. In principle, I can say, yes, I should forgive that person, but my feelings are all about hate, you know. And we don't choose our feelings. We can manage our feelings, but our feelings, feelings are things that happen to us. Happiness happens to us. Sadness happens to us. Depression happens to us. We don't choose to say, I say, okay, five minutes from now, I'm going to be joyful. Or ten minutes from now, I'm going to be angry at, at somebody. You know, I, you, we don't choose our feelings. Our feelings are things that happen to us. That is our human, our human existence. Hum, thoughts happen to us. We often have unwanted thoughts. We may think about something we didn't want to think about. We might have a memory that we didn't want to dwell on as we're walking along and some bad memory comes to us. We didn't choose to have that bad memory come to us. It just happened. But the same thing, too, if, if we're struggling with anger or grudges or lack of forgiveness, as long as we've made an effort... I believe that that's sufficient. And over time, you'll find that you can kind of wear that emotion, wear that grudge down. It's like grinding it down slowly over time. But sometimes it takes years and decades, and sometimes it, it never happens. If somebody's done something really unforgivable to somebody, it, that other person has what we would call a moral wound. Um, it's, it's a moral injury. And uh, I, if you ever want to go on the internet, look up my, <coughs> my talk for Leyden University um, that I did last year on, on moral injury. And I, I, we spend about an hour, I, I'm, I'm the moderator for that talk, but it's, it's a very good talk on that. But so do you have to reconcile with that person, or do, is reconciling in your heart enough? Reconciling in your heart is enough. You know, it's, it's interesting. Scripture doesn't, for the most part, ask us to reconcile with people. That's an ideal so we know that when Zacchaeus, he perfected his 
uh, existence through reconciling. But the reality is we just can't reconcile with everybody because sometimes you'll never see somebody again who you dealt with, so there's no way to reconcile with them. Um, other times it's impossible for you. Other times it's impossible for them. So, so we just have to make that best effort to be reconciled to everyone as best as possible. So and at least in our heart we have to do our best and say, sometimes you have to say, I forgive them. Maybe your feelings are all about hate for what they did to you, but you can at least in your mind say that you forgive them. And, and, and hopefully your feelings will eventually line up with, with, uh, with what's in your mind. But as I say, that the mind says what should be, but the heart says what is. And we can't change what's in our hearts necessarily. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, Father? Is, is there any reason why something about this is a notion in, in this prayer before communion? That the, the prayer is all about receiving communion worthily, and this is such a big part of Christ's teaching about worshiping worthily. Mm -hmm. it's, are, are you talking about uh, holding grudges? Or? Holding grudges if you have something against your neighbor. Yeah, well that's just one of a thousand sins that would come under the umbrella of this prayer. But yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, we're called to forgive. When we don't forgive, we are guilty of that. We're just like the ungrateful debtor, right? The ungrateful debtor was forgiven, but he himself wouldn't forgive. And then his own forgiveness was withdrawn uh, by God. So yeah, but that, but yeah, but I mean, grudges. That this is just one of ten thousand or twenty million sins that would fall under the umbrella of this prayer. But but it is one that everybody struggles with because almost everybody here has been hurt by somebody. Everybody here has been betrayed by somebody. Everybody's had some harm done to them by somebody, which was completely unfair, and, and you were an innocent victim. And, and that's that's our human experience, and we need to process that spiritually and work towards it. It's, it's called spiritual work. We need to work hard on our spirituality and we need to work hard on the things of the heart so that we can align ourselves with, with God's principles and, and Christianity and with Christian love and forgiveness. That's the most important thing. But this captures, this captures a, a whole panoply of sins. All sins fall under this prayer, under the umbrella of this prayer. So, but it is how we prepare ourselves. But it's because God knows we're coming up with these sins that we do this prayer before communion. What would it be like to receive communion without doing this prayer? Isn't that a kind of a weird thought? You know? Almost almost frightening to go for communion without having recited this prayer. But this prayer gives us the confidence of knowing that at least we have made a high act of repentance uh, for all of the sins we've committed in our lives. And especially when we engage it. But that's why it's important that we don't just mumble our way through this prayer. Experience this prayer as, as we've done over the last two hours. Try to experience that in, those, those, uh, in the minute that it takes to recite it before communion. And, and try, to, try to bring that into your heart and, and raise your, your mind and your heart to that level. So, and it will, it will be for a more worthy reception of you first. So. Okay. Okay, everybody sleepy? <laughs> All right. Okay, well, anyway, I just want to say thank you all for your wonderful uh, attention and, and prayers and, and, uh, and, uh, and listening so nicely. And I don't think anyone fell asleep this afternoon, so I'm impressed. So that's, that's very good. And uh, so I just want to tell you, you've been a great class to teach. I really enjoyed my journey with you, and I'm looking forward to relaxing with you over the next day and a half yet as we, uh, we enjoy our time here in this very holy place amongst these very holy men who have uh, opened their doors to us uh, to, to do our retreat. So again, thank you all very much, and I look forward to seeing you uh, all later on. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So would this be like it? Yeah, I can, I can yeah, make all the PowerPoint and I can also...